Hello, hello, hello. You know, in celebration of selfie being officially inaugurated in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, we're going to take a selfie right here, right now. So can we turn on the house lights a little bit and everyone's going to join me? Put your hands up. We're all in this together. And smile, say hi. Well, there's, it's not video, but... All right, take that, Ellen. <clears throat> Oops, go back. All right, so inspiration comes from many places and oftentimes from uh, many unusual sources. And so that's kind of the sort, the sort of the theme that I want to talk about today. And I want you to get, uh, I want to get you starting to think a slightly differently from what your usual habits are. And I want to learn from some of the habits and some of the practices of some of the world's leading innovators. And that's what I'm going to share with you today in my talk. Um, but I first want to start off with a personal story. Um, so I oftentimes have the privilege of actually getting to work from home, remotely from home. Um, and in doing so, I get to take my, my son to and from school. And I cherish those moments because the conversations that I have with my son um, are absolutely uh, unique and invaluable to me. And uh, I recall this one morning, we're driving, I was driving him to school and it was a sunny day. And usually he's a chatterbox in the car, but today he was actually, that day he was actually silent. He was three years, three years old at that time. And uh, he was gazing out the window. And he quietly turned his head and looked to me and he said, look daddy, the sun is playing peekaboo. And my gut instinct, my reaction was actually to say, no son, that's not how it works and this is how the sun works and so forth. But in that very instance, I actually paused and hesitated. And I said, you know, let him sort of sit in that sense of pure innocence, that unique sense of perspective. It's something that we lose as we get older into our adulthood. But it got me thinking even further. I live in a world of innovation. I do a lot of innovation for companies in healthcare and even companies outside of healthcare. And it got me thinking, are we actually capturing every perspective that we need to truly innovate? And are there things that we're missing from the equation? We all know the usual stuff, but are there things that we're missing? And so I started on a quest to try to get in the heads of some of the world's leading innovators and try to figure out what's going on in terms of what makes them unique and better than some of the others that are out there. After all, we all have the same talent pool, the same resources, the same information that we can tap into. And what I realized was that there was a common ingredient. They were all somewhat unusual in a small percentage. Part of them lived in a world that was on the fringes, right? And this unusual quality gave them some sort of extraordinary ability to actually innovate better than, than, than some of the others. And in, in a sense, they're almost like a superhero power, right? Superheroes, you know, we're all superheroes. We all have the ability to be a superhero. We all have some power within us to do something um, extraordinary. And the common ingredient was the fact that a lot of these innovators acted like superheroes in their own worlds. And they actually fought a lot of the characteristics within superheroes. And so I, I started on this journey, I started about a year ago interviewing and having dialogues with a lot of these great interviews and trying to get inside their head. And I'm working towards a book um, to publish a lot of this stuff and try to uncover some of the patterns. And I'm gonna share with you some of those insights um, that I've learned along the way with you here today. But before doing that, I wanna take a step backwards. I wanna define the challenge that we have ahead of us in healthcare. Ivan Illich, for those, those of you guys who don't, who don't know him, he was actually a controversial author and philosopher um, who wrote a very popular book called Medical Nemesis, uh, Limits to Medicine, back in the, in the 70s. Um, and he was controversial in the sense that he challenged a lot of the preconceptions of healthcare. And a lot of those still resonate today, if you've ever read the book. There's a lot of um, ingredients in there that are still uh, resonate with the, the system today. But he made a statement that said, modern medicine is a negation of health. It isn't organized to serve human health, but only itself as an institution. It makes more people sick than it heals. And I think that still resonates with our environment today. And so a colleague, in my, a, a colleague of mine and, 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 um, and I set out to sort of look at the literature and, and, and find the, the reports around what is truly causing morbidity and mortality in this country. And we, we pulled together a number of meta-analyses reports. And more often than not, iatrogenic causes typically came to the f top five to 10 causes of, of m and But if you accounted for unnecessary medical procedures um, and interventions and the complications that came from those, 
it quickly rose to the number one leading cause of morbidity and mortality in this country. Our own doing is creating the harm in our system. And if you put that in sort of visual terms, that's up to seven jumbo jets crashing per day for a year. We don't let that happen in other industries, yet somehow we let it slip by in healthcare. But this is really not that surprising to me, right? Because healthcare sort of just happened over the years. It was never designed from the bottom up. When you have the constraints, right, we're sort of a unique industry that we have to abide by safety rules. We have regulations, constraints, rituals, traditions. And so over the course of time, we've just put band-aids and patches on the different problems that we've encountered into the system. And so going forward, we cannot really solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we first created them. And so the way I look at, look at the world of innovation, uh, especially technological innovation, there were actually three waves over the course of time. The first one was really around the 60s and 70s where you had this, this, the foundational elements of the internet, um, you know, dial-up and broadband, connectivity, storage, speed. That laid the infrastructure for a lot of the stuff that we're seeing today. The next wave of innovation was really incremental, incremental innovation. And you can argue that that's still sort of going on today. This is taking the infrastructure that we had and building solutions on top of those. Right? So these includes a lot of the apps that we see in the marketplace, search, the wearable devices, software applications, and many, many more. And this is going to continue going forward. And my argument is that we have to, if we really want to move forward, we have to look at transformative innovation and what it takes to think in a transformative fashion. What do I mean by transformative innovation? It means reimagining the experience of an entire industry. And we're starting to see that play out in many other industries such as education, you know, the retail environments, music, the way we consume music today is drastically different than it was 10 years ago. And so what's going to be that reimagined experience in healthcare going forward? If we look back into the 20th century, a lot of innovation was about creating products that were designed for solving problems, right? Great case example of that is electronic health records. There's probably a technologist in the mid-90s or early 90s who went out and surveyed a number of doctors and said, listen, if I could archive all of your patient information, put it into an electronic database that you can search, organize, retrieve, and follow along, would that be useful to you? And universally, every doctor said, absolutely. So the technologist goes out, raises $5 million in funding, builds the product, brings it back to the doctor and says, here it is, now use it. And not a single doctor used it. It wasn't until a decade or two later, with the incentive and disincentive programs that we start to use electronic health records. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it wasn't designed around the experiences of the individual. And so going forward into the 21st century, as we further go in, into the 21st century, we need to think about innovation in terms of experiences. Experiences designed around people. Not just solving problems, that's very important. But when you think about experiences designed around people, you have to take into account perspectives, perceptions, empathy things that often aren't accounted for in the way we think about innovation today. This is one of my favorite blog posts, and I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but um, catch me afterwards and I'll show you the full blog post. There's a lot of profanity in here, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to read it out loud, but this is a guy who was truly upset about his burrito experience. And he took it to the blog and, 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 and he just let out his frustrations. I mean, how, how many of you have gone and had a burrito where the person making it just put everything sort of in layers, right? Right? They weren't mixed together, just in layers. And he describes things in here. It's hilarious. And he, and he talks about taking a bite in, and he's in a, a cilantro cavern, right? Or, or an abyss of sour cream. Um, and, and the problem is, and this, this resembles healthcare today, right? All the elements are in the burrito, right? They're all lined up there, but that doesn't matter the experience is still flawed for the person eating the burrito. And so if you look at all the incremental innovations that we have, can you read that? I guess some of you can read. <laughs> and I love this last term here, it calls it burrito abomination. Um, so in healthcare, our experience is not integrated. A lot of the incremental innovations are there, but it's not integrated into a unified experience. So transformative innovation comes about from the random collision of unusual ideas and perspectives. So I want to quickly jump into um, some of the habits that I've learned from some of the innovators that I'm speaking to. The first one is that they live in the interstitium. 
So what does that mean? In healthcare, we oftentimes get siloed in the perspective of what we know and understand within healthcare, and we often fail to look outside of our industry. And what I've realized is that a lot of these superhero innovators, these unusual innovators, sit within different industries. I don't live a healthcare life, an education life, an entertainment life. I just live life. And so when we think about a unified experience, we have to understand how all of that connects. And that's how we're going to get to a place of transformative innovation in the context of healthcare. Another way to look at it is a simple Venn diagram. On the left-hand side here is the incremental stuff. This is the stuff that we know. This is the stuff that we read in the paper all the time. It's the stuff that we're playing with. It's the stuff that we're building on. And then on the other side is the moonshot innovation. This is the stuff like Google X is working in their labs, the stuff that we have no clue of what's going to come out. But the real magic happens at the intersection. What these innovators know is they know something that others don't know yet. And oftentimes that information and that intelligence is gained by sitting at the interstitium of different industries and different verticals. The second um, practice is that they, they make remixes through unusual collisions. Um, a famous example, when, when Marissa Meyer came to the helm of Yahoo, uh, she instituted a very controversial policy that was unwelcomed about no more workers can, can work remotely from home, everyone had to be in the office. But her thinking around that was, is if I could actually get different departments to collide with each other, I might have some unique ideas and innovations. And in fact, that did turn true. When the Yahoo weather team cross-pollinated with the Flickr team, which is a picture sharing site, and they'd recently acquired at that time, they created one of the most beautiful, real-time, localized picture weather map experiences that's out there today. Disney, when we think about Disney, we oftentimes think about cruise ships, theme parks, movies. Um, but Disney is actually in the business of customer service. Right? They're in the business of creating enjoyable experiences. And so they thought, well, that's not just relevant to what we do. It's relevant to everybody. And they created the Disney Institute to essentially take their learnings around customer-centered experiences and apply that to the context of healthcare and other verticals as well. A classic example is, the, is sort of the mashup between our retail experience and the office experience and the whole spawn of a, a brand new category of retail clinics that we all know and, um, that are in the marketplace today. The next principle is apply choice over universals. Um, and they understand the personalization and the choice that um, our customers want. So I, I drew some inspiration here from uh, Malcolm Gladwell, who talks about the story of this guy, Howard Moskowitz, who is, uh, he was a psychophysicist and a consultant, and he was called upon by Pepsi and Prego to basically, and this is like in the mid-60s mid or 70s, and he was called upon to find out what's the best Pepsi or what's the best spaghetti sauce. And he did tons of research, thousands of people, and what he realized is that there was no best spaghetti sauce or no best Pepsi. There were best Pepsis. Every individual had a different preference and a different palate and a different taste. And because of his research, we see grocery shelves like this. Before, there only used to be one or two different spaghetti sauces before his research. And now we have all of these options to choose from. And the same thing holds true in healthcare. We can't design around universals. We have to understand the individual preferences of the people that we're interacting with. Because this is actually our audience. You know, we have different reactions, different perceptions, different perspectives. Um, and there's actually a story behind this slide, but I, I don't think I'll have time to share that story. Um, but what's happening today, for example, are you, you know, I've got the Misfit Shine on. You know, some people like to wear things on their wrist, on their shoes, on their shirts, uh, multiple different places, um, but giving choice. The next one is about challenging basic assumptions. So Einstein has another famous quote that says, if I had 60 minutes to solve a problem, I'd spend the first 55 minutes you know, getting the question right, and then with the remaining five minutes, I can come up with a solution very easy. So in doing so, we need to unlearn some old habits and challenge our basic assumptions. How are we coexisting with technology today? Or are we just producing stuff that's interfering with the way we deliver our care? What are the future roles of medical professionals or patients? Are we designing stuff for what we believe the physician is to do today? or the nurse, or are we designing stuff for what we believe they should be doing in the future? How does space fit into everything, right? The physical space. We heard you know, a bunch of folks talk about the fact that there's pre and post acute care. How do we redesign the experience accounting for the fact that we may not be need to be in the hospital every time? A good example of this is, uh, of reframing the question is from Google HR. 
So Google HR wanted to make their employees healthier. And the natural question to ask is, well, you know, how do we get healthy foods into our cafeteria? Or how do we put bikes onto our campuses? But they didn't ask that question. They framed the question this way. They said, how do we get each and every one of our employees to live two years longer? And simply by reframing that question, you can imagine their solution was drastically different and it had a much greater impact on the outcomes of their campus. Other industries challenging the assumptions, education, flipping the classroom. So Sal Khan has a video, uh, the, the Sal Khan, the Khan Academy, where he takes video uh, modules. And his concept is around uh, the notion of we should not have the lectures in the classroom, but rather take that to the home using video technology and use the classroom for interactive time and have people learn on their own or, or learn with others. And that same con concept is being applied into the healthcare context with flipping the clinic. Thomas Goetz, who is a, a former executive editor of, of Wired Magazine, teamed up with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And they're basically trying to gather examples of, of clinics and environments that are actually leveraging the educational model of flipping the classroom to that clinic concept. Making the invisible visible. So this is essentially about taking advantage of underutilized resources and creating new markets out of those. The best examples in our current environment that we're probably all familiar with, eBay, Airbnb, the largest hotel chain that doesn't even own a hotel room, Uber, right, for, for, for driving. Um, in the context of healthcare, Pager is actually the Uber for healthcare, taking advantage of underutilized medical professionals and doing home care and uh, preventing um, any kind of acute care visits into the doctor's office. One of my own projects is Omnio. We're reimagining the care delivery paradigm. Rather than just prescribing medications, can we empower medical professionals to prescribe educational tutorials, devices, apps, and so forth to create a holistic solution? In the sake of time, I'll skip over that example. Applying the Madonna curve, and in Madonna here, I'm referring to the singer. She had this incredible ability to actually reinvent herself every time she reached her peak. And that was a common element of every great interview that I, that I interviewed. They knew when to disrupt themselves. And oftentimes, a lot of the failures in the organizations that I advise or consult with, um, oftentimes, you know, tackle innovation when it's almost too late. And so being able to see when's the right time to cannibalize yourself is a critical component to innovation. Best example that we're all familiar with is Apple iPod, when it was at its peak, was actually disrupted with the iPhone. They introduced the iPhone exactly at that, at that, uh, when the iPad hit its peak. But we don't see this kind of change happening in healthcare. The last um, principle I want to share with you is that believe, they believe that nothing is impossible. And this is actually um, and some inspiration I got just a couple weeks ago when I met this individual, Mick Ebeling, um, who's one of the most inspiring individuals. He runs in a lab called Not Impossible Labs. And he made this quote, the moment something impossible is proven possible, massive progress follows. This is a guy who knows, knew nothing about healthcare. He was a media um, specialist. And he read an article in the paper about the bombings in Sudan. And there was a story about this little boy named Daniel. And Daniel, in trying to save himself, had actually wrapped his arms around the tree. And when the bomb dropped, unfortunately, his arms severed and he was left with no arms. And this is a common story amongst many bomb victims out in those, in, in those areas. And in the paper, what Mick had read was the fact that Daniel said, I, wish I, had, I, rather, I would rather have died than have no arms. And Mick is like, well, we've got prosthetics. So he called up the doctor that was treating him and said, we've got tons of prosthetics. Why don't you give these people prosthetics? He said, we have thousands of victims here that are amputees. Each prosthetic is $15,000. We can't afford it. So Mick, knowing nothing about healthcare, brought together a team of like five people into his home and in two weeks hacked together a solution. And he goes back to the, to the area and says, if I could deliver prosthetics for under $100, would you buy it? Under $100. And they said, we'd buy it in bulk. So he hops on a plane, takes a 3D printer, four iPads, goes into the community, and he basically described it almost like the gods must be crazy, right? He just dropped the... the, the the, the 3D printer on the iPad, and everyone sort of got these, these gaze looks on their eyes, like, what the hell is that? And in two weeks, he basically produced a prosthetic for Daniel and saw him eat for the first time. On his way back, by the, and before he left, he actually trained the local medical professionals to use the devices. By the time he flew back from Sudan, they had already created four or five prosthetics for other victims. And that's really about making the impossible possible, that anything can be done. 
So I leave you with this. What makes you 10% unusual? What's that secret power that makes you a superhero? And how can we learn from the people that are doing amazing things and draw upon their experiences? Thank you.